Hello, I'm Paul Perello, and welcome to The Philly Factor. Now sitting at the corner of 3rd and Chestnut Streets in Old City is a museum dedicated to the Revolutionary War. On the inside, the Museum of the American Revolution documents the history of the colony's fight for independence. While construction was uh, commencing on this project in Old City, archaeologists made quite a find, as a matter of fact, a number of finds in the ground as they were excavating the property. When uh, the museum actually acquired the land at Third and Chestnut Streets, it came with the stipulation that an archaeological investigation needed to be conducted. But when that excavation began, workers literally hit pay dirt with relics dating back to the colonial days, the finding and founding of this great nation of ours, right up into the Second World War. The work at the excavation site has been documented in a new book that not only shares this glimpse into colonial times, but also tells the story of the growth of Philadelphia. Archaeology at the site of the Museum of the American Revolution is the name of the book. The author of the book is urban archaeologist Dr. Rebecca Yeaman. And uh, Dr. Yeaman, thanks for being with us on the program. It's such a pleasure, and it was such a great opportunity to be able to excavate that site. Uh, Third and Chestnut, a lot of people are familiar with Third and Chestnut. They, they know where it is in Old City. But in order to give them the context of this, how this museum grew up out of the ground, it is, it is uh, built on the location of the old National Independence Historical Park Visitor Center that was constructed for the Bicentennial in 1976, correct? Yes. <laughs> and so the stipulation, as I mentioned, was when the museum purchased the land, it was mandated that an excavation needed to be done on that property. So was there ever an excavation done prior to the building of the museum? It's a slightly more complicated process that they got, the way that they got the land. Sure. The museum was originally going to be built at Valley Forge. Okay. And so they had bought land at Valley Forge. But then nobody wanted that museum to be at Valley Forge. And so they searched for a site inside Center City that they could use instead. And the site, of course, they found, I think even Mayor Rendell was involved in that search and Jerry Lindfest. Uh, you know, already had this building standing on it. Mm -hmm. And so that building would have to come down in order to build the new building. So, but that building was owned by the Park Service. So when the Park Service traded the land at, Val uh, at uh, Third and Chestnut right. for the land in Valley Forge, they said, well, then you'll have to follow the law that would require an excavation on a federal property. Mm. Even though the property is owned by the museum, it isn't federally owned anymore, they still had to follow what is prescribed by the National Historic Preservation Act, which is that an excavation must be, uh, or at least a, a, an investigation, must be carried out if something owned by the federal government or it funded by federal funds is going to disturb something significant from the past. So first you have to figure out, well, is there something significant there? Right, right. Was there anything significant ever there? And then you have to figure out how disturbed was the thing that used to be there. Sure. So we had to know whether the construction of the visitor center had destroyed the remains of 18th, 19th century occupation on the site. So we had to do a documentary study, and then we had to evaluate what might have disturbed it. Well, there was no basement under the visitor center. Hmm. So that was good news. That yeah. meant that, well, no, and they, so they didn't have to do an excavation, and, or they didn't do an excavation. And that visitor center was built on top of the old foundations of the 19th century buildings that had been taken down mm. when the Park Service originally acquired the land in the 1950s. So you can see it's a long process. Complicated process. A complicated yeah. process. Yeah. So what we were looking at was the removal of the rubble from the foundations of the 19th century buildings, and then we were looking under the basement floors of those buildings to see if it, anything was left from the 18th century. So when this work begins then, um, you really didn't know if you were gonna find anything, but you really hit the mother load, if you will, from all, of all these artifacts 
that were discovered there? Well, urban archaeology is always a surprise. Mm -hmm. And I always worry when I start, oh my goodness, I'm not going to find anything. And I've <laughs> told the client that we have to spend oodles of money and they're going to be horribly disappointed right. and I'm going to be disappointed because we're not going to find anything. And then, lo and behold, I mean, it, it's really quite amazing. Because even though there are deep basements for the 19th century buildings, once you lift up the floors, you often find the bottoms of what were backyard, we call them features. So it's the bottom of the shaft that was under the privy, mm -hmm. which was under the outhouse. Okay. So, or the bottom of a well that was in somebody's backyard or somebody's front yard, or the bottom of a cistern that was under the edge of the roof to catch water. So we, we're looking not necessarily at the whole shaft, they were all built of brick in Philadelphia, but not in all cities, but you're looking at the truncated bottom of that shaft. Well, because they didn't have garbage collection in the 18th century, uh, people had to get rid of stuff that they needed to get rid of, and so they threw much of their debris into these shafts, even when they were in use. So, you know, the privy might get garbage from last night's dinner as well as the various other things that go in privy. Sure, yeah. So we're looking at that, that those remains. And out of those remains, we're trying to tell stories about the people who lived there. What was the um, length of time um, that the excavation, I mean, how long was the whole excavation process? Well, when they started to take down the visitor center, we had to be on the site to be sure they didn't disturb anything during the process of taking down the building. Right, right. So Tim Mansell, who ultimately was the field director, so he was out there all the time talking to me on the phone, but I wasn't out there all the time. He was watching them take down the building. So that started, I don't know, in April or May or something like that. The full out excavation started in July. This is 2014. And I think we were finished sometime in October, but we had to come back because the contractor had to have a road going down into the site so he could bring down his big machines. Mm. So that road covered up part of the site. So that had to be excavated later when they could destroy the road. Right. One of the really challenging things about doing urban archaeology is that you have to work side by side with construction people. Sure. Now they have very different skills <laughs> and very different goals than we do. Yep. And so, you know, there's the potential for conflict. <laughs> However, um, the important thing is to work out a way that you can cooperate and that you can support each other. So you have to learn about their work and they have to learn about our work and we have to learn to respect one another so that we can get the job done. In the case of the Museum of the American Revolution site, it was really hard because they were on a very tight schedule and they wanted to shore the site uh, as they went down. So if they were digging down to put up the shoring so mm -hmm. that the walls wouldn't fall in, in on us and on them, we had to excavate following their schedule rather than following our ideal schedule. We weren't alone out there doing an archaeological excavation. We were out there with a construction crew doing an archaeological excavation you, as they were constructing. Yeah, you, you've been involved in a number of archaeological digs, not only um, down at Third and Chestnut, but throughout the greater Philadelphia area, and perhaps even up and down uh, the, the East Coast and around the country. What, how significant was this dig when you look at other projects that you were involved in? Is it the location, um, not knowing what it was that you might find there? Um, so how significant, what was the impact of this, of this dig compared to other projects that you worked on? The fun thing about historical archaeology and urban archaeology certainly is that you, you don't know what story you're going to tell when you start. Mm -hmm. I mean, we knew there was potential. We knew there had been 23 historic properties within the site that the museum now stands. So the potential was to find remains that, you know, that related to all the people who lived on the 23 historic properties. Right. That, of course, is not what we found. We found something much more interesting. And what's really interesting about this particular site is we can tell the whole story of Philadelphia in microcosm. Because mm. the earliest feature, the earliest one of these privies full of artifacts that we found, dates to the beginning of the 18th century. Mm. Well, William Penn, you know, divided up this block as part of the original at the end of the 17th century when the city was first 
uh, you know, laid out, yeah. basically. I mean, this block was part of the original layout, and we have a feature that dates very early in the, in the block's use. Mm. We have another feature that dates to the 1730s, when things were more established, people were building their houses there, they had little businesses on the ground floor, and they lived upstairs. And we have a, a tavern assemblage that comes from the 1730s. Then we have another tavern assemblage that comes from the 1770s, which is, of course, the revolutionary period. Right. How fantastic. Mm -hmm. And that tavern goes with a back alley. The other, the 1730s one is with Chestnut Street. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, in a more, um, I don't know, fashionable location than the one that was on the back alley. Then we have a feature that dates to the 1830s, mm. when uh, people, it's after the Revolutionary War, so we can learn about how they're living at that par part of the city in the 1830s. Then we have the foundations of a building that was very commercial, that was built in the 1850s. And then we have wow. the remains of um, the, an early office of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Really? Which was eventually, wow. <laughs> yes, and then, we have the remains of a button factory that was in business from the uh, 1920s to the Second World War. So you see, we have the whole history of the city. Mm -hmm. That's very unusual. Yeah. I mean, you know, plenty of excavations find lots of 18th century features and lots of 19th century features, and sometimes your budget only lets you analyze one group or the other. Mm -hmm. But in this case, we had this nice representation of over time. And you know, it's a great story to tell, and yeah. that's why we have the book, because it's really a story of Philadelphia and yeah. how it grew and how the city changes. And you know, when you walk to work, or maybe not here, but you know how things change mm -hmm. on the, in the urban landscape. Mm -hmm. One store goes out of business and another building is built on the site, and you can hardly remember what was there before. Sure. So we kind of have this record of the process which is, uh, you know, pretty special. Uh, given those items that you just described, it's a, it's a significant snapshot of life in Philadelphia. And I don't want to minimize everything that was uh, discovered there, but is there one aha moment or one aha find uh, that sort of leads the pack? That, that you, you, you talk about, you know, buttons that were discovered and you talk about, um, you know, I know in, in looking at the book, there were um, uh, earthenware, there were platters, there were bowls that were discovered. Anything that was that significant find that sort of stands out from all the other items? Well, there is a significant find because it's on the site of the Museum of the American Revolution. If it weren't on the site of the Museum of the American Revolution, it would just be another one of the finds. Yeah. But because it relates directly to the Revolutionary War, and I hope you have a picture of it, our punch bowl, um, it's, you know, it's just too good to be true. Mm -hmm. I mean, how is it that we by chance could find something sure. that has to do with one of the causes of the yeah. Revolutionary War mm -hmm. and is a good enough thing to display in the museum? Yeah. So, uh, you know, for those of you who can go to the museum, you go to the third room and on the far right, you're gonna see this punch bowl. It's a beautiful punch bowl. And it has a picture of a ship on the inside and below the ship it says, success to the Trifena. Mm. That is the star artifact of this particular excavation. And that is on display at the, at the museum. It is on display, and third so room on the right. Where are all the other artifacts then that were excavated in this dig? When we do these kinds of excavations that are done for the Nas because of the National Historic Preservation Act, um, we have to catalog the whole collection and we have to write it a technical report and interpret what it all means and all of that, that stuff. But usually the artifacts go to Harrisburg and mm -hmm. get there, and they have to be curated properly in proper b kinds of boxes and blah, blah, blah. So, and it just goes into the basement and storage. In this case, the museum was willing to take much of the collection mm. because they could use it. They could use it for educational programming, they can use it for interpretation, for lectures, for illustrating lectures. They, they're, going to exhibit more artifacts than just our punch bowl eventually. I mean, mm -hmm. they're drawing on the collection. They can use it to teach people how to glue artifacts together to make them whole again. So it's, it's so gratifying to me because so many of my collections that I've loved, you know, excavating, loved thinking about are gone in the sense that they're just buried in boxes, whereas sure. this collection I can visit. 
yeah, for sure. <laughs> as well as other people. Yeah. How mm -hmm. many people worked on your team in that excavation? I think there were six technicians in the field. Okay. Tim Bansell, who was an absolutely terrific field director, was there all the time. And then he had uh, Catherine Wood and Kevin Bradley with him mm -hmm. for the whole excavation. But then there were p people who we had hired just for that work, you know, who didn't uh, work for John Milner Associates, which is the company that did the work, uh, who came on for the, for mm -hmm. the project. And it spoiled them forever because their <laughs> artifacts were so juicy. Yeah, so it yeah. was a very special, a special project. We got about 88,000 artifacts. Wow. And that's just some th chips of things, not whole vessels. But yeah. you know, then we put the vessels back together to make it mean something. That, that number, 88,000, is that um, a large number? compared to other excavation or other digs that you've it's, been on? It's, or, it's, or it's kind of a typical number for an it? urban excavation. Okay. However, I did a very big project in New York on the site of Five Points, which is the most notorious 19th century slum in New York, if mm -hmm. you know the Martin Scorsese's movie, sure. mm -hmm. uh, Gangs of New York. It's that part of the city. And we had uh, 850,000 artifacts. Wow. That's <laughs> so that's more. It took yeah. six years. <laughs> In this case, it took us one year to write a technical report. Yeah. Uh, Give for the, for the viewers at home an idea of what the process is like when you um, are involved in an archaeological dig. I'm sure, uh, um, you're the professional, I'm not. I'm not just going to show up with a shovel and just start you know, shoveling into the ground. Definitely not going no. to do that. You it's, it's meticulous work that has to um, be very careful because you don't know what it is that you're, it may be nothing, and then again, it could be something significant. It's very tedious if you don't, <laughs> if you don't like doing it, because yeah. we go layer by layer, of course. Yeah. So even though we're only digging in these shafts, we're not digging usually in intact ground surface. Mm -hmm. We're still digging stratigraphically. And that means you're digging layer by layer in a very controlled sp spot mm -hmm. on the site that we identify specifically by mapping it and um, keeping track, because you have to keep track of where everything comes from. That's right. very, very important. Mm. If you don't do that, if you're just collecting artifacts, it doesn't mean anything, because you yeah. can't connect it up with the people who, whose artifacts they were. Mm -hmm. So our whole object, and my whole object certainly as, the, as this kind of archaeologist, is to be able to connect the artifacts to the people so that we can say something about the past that is meaningful, right. not just, you know, this bottle that dates to 1810 was thrown out here. That, yeah. That's not worthwhile. I need to know all the bottles, all the other things that went with the whole group of things. So yes, the people who come to work for us have taken field schools, they have experience, they know how to do the record keeping, mapping, record keeping, photography. Some people find it just deadly, but it's absolutely essential on any archaeological project here, Egypt, you know, yeah, <laughs> anywhere, sure. China, all, that we all use those techniques. So we all understand one another. And so one of the members of the team might hold this object, small or large, in their hands. Yes. Do, do they turn it over to someone else who then secures it in a manner, whether it's put in a box, in a bag? I mean, first of all, I would be a bundle of nerves if I found something, significant or not significant, and would be afraid that because we're talking about stuff that's hundreds of years old. And covered with, uh, you know, human waste. Yeah. Because remember, we're at the bottom of, of privies. Privy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's in sticky dirt, and, yeah, you know, right. we've, we've used a hose to, yeah. get the, to get the dirt off so that we can see. For instance, the finding of the success to the Trifena punch bowl. Mm -hmm. So Catherine was at the bottom of this shaft that she had been excavating layer by layer. Mm -hmm and had been dismantled as she went down, because we have to stay within OSHA regulations. Right, you right. can only be you know, so much below, below the surface. So she began to uncover, with her trowel, she began to uncover sherds. And she thought, you know, it looked as if there might be some words on the sherds or a picture on the, so she called us all over. She's so excited. <laughs> and so she carefully takes these sherds out. They all came from one level right. at the bottom of the, mm -hmm. of the privy. And you, so you put them in plastic bags, and we mark the plastic bag with what we call provenience information, which is 
the location on the ground and the location, you know, uh, mm -hmm. vertically. And then when we got back to that, so we, we glued those shirts together right. that, that day, that night. And it looked as if indeed it was a ship and it was words, but yeah. you know, it wasn't clear. And when we got back to the laboratory, because you excavate and you just put things in bags by, layer by layer, mm -hmm. but you don't um, necessarily put them together when you're in the field. Right. So when we got back to the laboratory, many more shirts that glued together with the ones that Catherine had found mm -hmm. had also been excavated, which we didn't recognize in the field. So because they're marked with that provenience information, you can match them up. Mm. You know, they came from the same vessel, and then we could put the vessel together and almost have a complete object, which yeah. is fantastic. Well, so you, you don't, when you're in the field, you said you would be nervous if you found anything. It's not like that. Yeah. I mean, it's dirty, you, you know, you have yeah. a hard hat on, <laughs> you're sweaty, I mean, you're, you're doing the job, it's, yeah. it's work. Were there any items that were found fully intact, or there, I'm guessing because they sat there for so long, and people basically were throwing the stuff into the ground. That's right. Chances are they were going to break and, and be busted up, and there mm -hmm. might be even some items that were in multiple pieces, but your team in the lab were able to piece these things piece them together. together. That's right. Yeah. But they're sure we found 19th century bottles that are yeah, that are you know whole. Yeah. And that's why you know people uh, who love to collect go dig these privies when they're not archaeologists, when they're just collectors, yeah. and they find 19th century bottles and they sell them in their uh, antique stores yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So which doesn't help us you know put together a picture of the past that we lost that record. Yeah. But yes, there are some things that are found whole. The, uh, the other question that I had for you is, you know, we, we talk about the, the extent of the work, of the meticulous nature of, uh, of the work here, is that it takes a special person uh, to have either the patience, the stamina, to dedicate their, themselves and their life to this, to this type of work. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The beauty of it is, for me, mm -hmm. is that it's physical and intellectual. So what incredible fun that is. You get to go wear your work boots and your blue jeans and dig in the dirt and get tired and you know, it's, you know, it's physical, it's physical. And then, of course, there's the challenge of figuring out what it means. Yeah. Putting it all together and figuring out what it means. And you have to read a lot of history, you have to know what the context is, you have to think imaginatively in order to think what you know what this little fragment of the past means in the context of the history that you know so it's uh, it's wonderful but not everybody likes it yeah. especially the digging part because it you know i had a very close friend who before he retired was sure that he wanted to be an archaeologist and he always envied me and at a party he would you know Question me and blah, blah, blah. and he did it. He went and went to one of these field schools for two months. He hated it. <laughs> hated it. So uncomfortable and it was so boring. And you know, I mean, some people cannot tolerate that sure. kind of tedium and dirt. Yeah. And, and dirty. You know, it's dirty. It's, it's not clean work, that's for <laughs> it's sure. It's not yeah. clean work. Yeah. And you're working side by side with machines. I mean, on this site, there are these huge machines swirling about us, so it's noisy. Sometimes we have to wear earplugs because mm -hmm. it's so noisy, you can't mm -hmm. hear each other talk. So, you know, there are all sorts of things, traffic, I mean, danger, all sorts, but I love all that stuff. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> uh, in the few minutes that we have left, uh, Rebecca, what is it that you hope people take away from this book? It's just not a snapshot of this project that took place at Third and Chestnut. But whether you are a history fan, you're a fan of Philadelphia, um, you like colonial era history, whatever it is, what is it you hope that people take away from your book? We haven't looked at any of the things. They were putting them up while you were talking. Oh, you're and okay. I didn't see them. Yeah, that's oh, a, hopefully. It, it all fits together, <laughs> trust me. Okay, uh, what I hope they take away from it um, is that that the archaeology can lead to a view of the past that's different than just the view that you get from a history book. Mm. Because you get introduced to people who are not in the history books. And so I want people to recognize that we do this archaeology in order to meet all the different kinds of people from the past. Mm -hmm. And we know that we are people in the present who are not 
you know, necessarily powerful people or people who are going to be in history books in the future. Yeah. So we're writing, we're, we're writing a history of the people who are us from the past, and I hope people really get that. Yeah, it's amazing because some of the artifacts that you uh, discovered, wig curlers, yes. uh, clay pipes, and you gotta sort of, when you look at the pictures in the book and you, you pick up the book or you go to the, you know, the, the, the museum, you gotta wonder what the backstory is behind these items. Yeah, well, William Smith, we think, is the one who was wearing those wig girlers. Yeah. So, you know, we do know things about them. They're, and they're lead weights from mm -hmm. that same, and that man, Samuel Garrigus. See, I know the names of these people. Sure. So these are people who, are, who we have introduced. Yeah. Uh, out of the dirt, we get, the, get real people. <laughs> well, I wanna thank you for your time. It is a uh, fascinating read. It's, uh, um, it's one of these books that you will find very difficult to put down because you want to go to the next page and see what is it that they found next. And, and uh, it really draws you into the story of uh, colonial Philadelphia through the Second World War. So uh, I want to encourage you to pick up the copy uh, of the book. Uh, it might be a book you want to pick up for yourself and maybe for another family member. Archaeology at the site of the Museum of the American Revolution uh, by Dr. Rebecca Yeaman. Dr. Yeaman, I want to thank you for your time. Continued success, best of luck, and maybe one of these days I'll come out to one of your dig sites and try my hand at it. <laughs> thank you so much, it was a pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. Until the next time, uh, thanks so much for watching there at home. My name is Paul Pirello, this is The Philly Factor.